thank you. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our inaugural virtual student conference. Um, this has been organised by the students of the SEG's Europe Regional Advisory Committee. Um, they are um, Aurelian, Mariana, Dominic, Pedro, um, Yuri, Myrna, and, my, and myself. Um, and we, we wanted to do this because we aimed at helping early career scientists um, from Europe um, to come together and to share their research in a more informal setting than, than a major conference. Um, and also a setting where it was completely free to attend. So there's no, um, there's no barrier for anyone who, who wanted to come and present and share their work in a, in a short format setting um, and people you know, in Europe and all over the world can, can come in and, and listen to them. Um, so we're really pleased that, that for everyone that, that's come to join and we're really excited to, for the, these two sessions that we have to show you some work from, from students across Europe. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll really enjoy everything. Um, can I just remind all the speakers um, and panellists to meet their microphones when they're not, when they're not presenting? Um, and for anyone who wants to ask a question, you can either type it in um, in the bar in the bar at the bottom of Zoom. There should be a, an option for Q and A where you can type your question um, that you may have for our speakers, um, or you can raise your hand and we can move you if you would like to um, ask the question yourself. Um, we we will monitor this as the talks progress, and then at the end of the talk, there'll be five minutes for questions where where we can do that about Q and A. Um, so yeah, if I I'll pass over to our um, to the chairs of our first ses session, and we can we can get going with it. Thank you, Stephanie. So the first session will be co-chaired by Pedro and me, and it's titled "Applications of Geophysics." We have four highly interesting talks for you. Each talk will be ten minutes long. Then we have five minutes for your questions and answers. The first um, presentation of this day will be um, um, presented by Elena Damian. She's a student at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom and will give us a talk on forensic geophysics and how this is applied to some buried elephants. Um, Elena, would you please unmute yourself, maybe turn on your camera and share your screen. Yeah, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just tell me when I can begin. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Can you see my screen all right? Yes, we do. Great. Okay, I'm going to begin now. Hi, everyone. My name is Elena Damian, and today I'm going to present my dissertation, which is called The Application of the Forensic Geophysics of the Elephant Buried in this United Kingdom. Um, so why, why did I want to do this? There is a, a lack of a strong foundation in geoforensics. It was only presented for the first time 100 years ago by a forensic scientist named Georg Popp. And ever since then, it has helped solve crime cases of both present and past. And so many scientists were very excited about it because geophysics um, allows you to analyze your site in a non-intrusive way. So you don't, you don't um, ruin any possible evidence that might solve your mystery. Um, however, um, geophysics and forensics have yet to be combined in a satisfactory amount. Um, so I wanted maybe to contribute to that. So moving on to, to the fair green, why did I go there? Um, it has been used for centuries um, as a public space for markets, for fairs, for circuses and menageries. And recently this year, a community project raised the point that a local legend might be true, the one of an elephant being buried under the fairy queen. However, when I started making um, investigation and research, I actually found um, two elephants. So I was, I was looking for the archives and I found um, two newspapers, the Norfolk News and This Express, one talking about an elephant in 1867 and the other one in 1932. So there was a lot of, you know, vague elements surrounding it. So what I did, I went to this and um, I found a local historian who was able to shed some light on what has happened. So what was going on? The first elephant, the one in the 18, 1867, 
uh, was believed to be cremated, so there wasn't much chance to actually find that. So we moved on to the next elephant in 1932, and some locals actually remember it. Uh, they remember seeing a crane and a white powder being poured over it, which we later on discovered it was quick climb. And on that note, we will come back to the quick climb a bit later. Um, so methods, um, the, the fair green um, is 16,000 meters square. So when you're presented with such a, with such a big area, how, how do you approach it? Um, I was trying to find the most I could about the site before going there, so I could save some time. Um, so two, two pieces of information that I was very happy about uh, was that the, the soil was very sturdy and very flat. And both these things, uh, I'm sure we all know, they're very good when it comes to um, the good functioning of geophysics equipment. And um, besides that, I was trying to, you know, visualize the anomalies. What was I expecting to get? So I would know to recognize it. Um, so I did a, a quick research on, on how big elephants are. So um, the anomaly, I was expecting it to be at least four meters long or um, three meters, which is like the height of, of an elephant. Um, and moving on, uh, the time actually came to, to go there. So my main geophysical equipment was GPR. Why? Um, because it allowed me to quickly investigate as much of the area in the shortest time possible. Um, we all know that in a geophysical survey, you have to be very sensible when it comes to time. You can't just be there, I don't know, for an indefinite number of days. So uh, in my case, I could only be there for five, for five days. Um, so that's why I choose the GPR to be my, my main geophysical equipment. And the antenna that I used was 500 megahertz one, a megahertz um, uh, yeah, antenna. Why? Because I was, I was happy with the resolution it was giving me. And usually 500 megahertz antenna gives you, um, depending on the soil that you're um, analyzing, it can give you one meter radar grams or two meters, sometimes a bit beyond two meters. So yeah, I, I was happy with all those, um, all those values because what I was expecting to find wasn't the elephant itself, but the um, hole that was dug up for it. Moving on, this is um, what, what I found and what I believe uh, is the, the burial of the, of the elephant. Um, when I, well, the, the first thing that is the most obvious about the, this anomaly is its size. It's six meters long um, and at least two meters deep. Again, because this is um, how much the GPR let me see. And why did I think it was man-made? Because just characteristic, um, boundaries the the edge of it is very sharp it's very linear in nature you don't usually see something so perfect if i may call it like that um so it was definitely man-made um and if you see if you look at the bottom of that um the bottom of the anomaly um you can see a higher contrast and therefore a higher reflectivity and this leads me to think that um, something was happening there, some different material, but um, moving under the limitations of the GPR, um, of course, I couldn't see um, much deeper than that. Um, of course, with, with GPR, you can tweak the values a tiny bit, there is, but there is just so much you can do. Um, however, I was happy with that. Um, but of course, you don't want to find an anomaly with just one geophysical equipment and be very confident in it. So before going to the, um, to the fair green, I was very set on the idea that my second geophysical equipment would be a magnetometer, but I couldn't use it because the anomaly that I found was actually in the middle of a playground. So all the errors that would have been generated by the surroundings would have made the magnetometer data be completely not usable. So what I ended up using was ERT kit um, in a dipole-dipole array why? Because it's good for vertical boundaries. I wasn't that interested in finding out the exact depth where the elephant was buried. I just, what I wanted it to do was just go by vertical segments and just find the anomaly somewhere where something was happening in a different manner. Um, and I did find that, as you can see in the, in the red square. Um, so what was the most obvious thing about it is that the anomaly has low resistivity. And now we're coming back to the quick line. 
And it's just a, a short fun fact about forensics and how um, oftentimes you have to combine it with different sciences. Uh, in my case, it was just, you know, some fast, very um, easy chemistry. Uh, Quicklime, of course, as you can see, has a low resistivity and has been known to be used by lots of farmers when their animals would die. Why? Because it has antibacterial properties. So you wouldn't want any possible diseases to be carried out onto the soil or the water bed or anything surrounding it. So that's what the, um, the people from the locals from this use for the elephant as well. And that um, ended up being something very good for me because I could, I could find the elephant much, much easier with the, with the low resistivity. However, um, you can see that it's right on the edge of my front sack. And this happened because of another limitation, which was the GPS that I used. Um, it did not point me to the right location because I was not analyzing the GPR data on the day, I would just come back to the lab and look at it. Um, so when I saw the um, anomaly that I was happy with, and then I had to go back to it, the GPS did not point me to the good direction. Um, so why didn't I do another one? It's just because of time limitation. Um, but but yeah, I'm, I'm still happy with it because um, there is an, the error produced by it. Um, sorry. The error produced by it only comes when it comes to the true resistivity value, but effect cannot just create a random anomaly so so big. Um, yeah, and and with that concluding my um, my study, I think that the fairy green in this is definitely historically rich, and um, due to time limitation, I cannot investigate some other futures that you might have had in it, like a cockfighting pit, a militia camp, or blacksmith houses. Um, I try to, as you can see, the, the image in the left-hand side and the one on the bottom are um, magnetometer data and GPR for the cockfighting pit, and um, the one on the right-hand side is just a uh, ERT um, featuring some ground disturbances possibly being caused by the militia camp. But um, is these pieces of information from the cockfighting pit and the militia camp are not as important as I think um, how important it is for future students to maybe go back there and further analyze and investigate the field and just you know going back and trying to match it with other data that students have uh, have found there and uh, just trying to you know um, maybe solve, solve the mystery through, through the beautiful geophysics um, equipment that we, we have available. Yeah, that, that, that would be my, my project. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Elena, for this interesting talk. So we have some time for questions. Please either raise your hand or type something into the chat window. Okay, if the others still need some time to think about a good question, I've got a question. Where do you see the limitations of your um, or of your forensics in general? I think elephants are quite nice target, but uh, where are the limitations when it comes to uh, forensics on people, smaller animals? Right, okay. So as I said in the beginning, I was very, very lucky to have um, a very flat, sturdy, um, area but sometimes well when it comes to you know um, more severe forensic cases um the bodies could be in a let's say swamp you do not see yourself um going with the gpr uh, or goodness with the with the erd in, in a swamp you know or in a humid area the, the erd should never be used um, um with somewhere where you know there's there's a lot of water so, Tiny amounts of water can make it work better, but not many of them, because what you basically do is like send electricity into the ground. Um, but yeah, I think definitely the type of area that you're analyzing is a great limitation when it comes to, to geoforensic. Or if you are, uh, let's say, if you analyze a, a slope or a hill, there are so many corrections that you have to do with it. I was just, my, my case was just the happy, happy fast one, to say like that. Okay, um, I have moved uh, to more so that uh, 
they can ask uh, their question directly. I've unmuted him. No, nope, trying to. Tamora, if you could unmute yourself, that'd be uh, great. You can ask your question. All right, well, uh, never mind. Uh, we'll go back to uh, the question in the chat box. Um, I guess the question is, did anyone dig there? Um, one meter is not too deep or not that deep. I'm sorry, what, what was the question? The first one was it if anyone dug up the, the elephant? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and no, so, so they did not do that. As I said before, the elephant was right in the middle of a playground. And um, this is quite, it's, it's a small, small town. They do not have, the community project doesn't have the funds yet to, to do that because of course you don't want to just go blindly into it. Um, you just want to be very careful when you when you dig something up that could uh, potentially be something very historically you know important um so you can't just go with i don't know like a shovel and just uh, dig it out so no that this is that is not going to happen in the near future as far as i'm concerned but it would definitely be, be interesting um okay. and of course i would like to reply that geophysics is of course never 100 percent because it's not intrusive um my, my data matched, but of course, like I said in my conclusion, I'm very happy if someone would go there in the future and try to, who knows, maybe correct me or, um, yeah, just further analyze it. Okay, we have an, another question in the chat. Um, um, this gentleman uh, didn't uh, follow why you couldn't use a magnetometer. Uh, could you please explain? Why did I not use it? Yeah. Right, so magnetometer, it's very easy to get um, errors with it. You're not supposed to wear any metal, any phones, any watches. Um, so you can only imagine the amount of errors that I would have gotten from being surrounded by swing, all type of uh, playground um, um, things. Okay, uh, we have another um, regarding your electrical resistivity results. The RMS error is 7.5%. What is the greatest acceptable value for RMS? Ooh, I'm, I'm actually not too sure on that. Um, I think it just, it comes from case to case. It depends what you're, what you're looking for. Um, of course, in my case, I wasn't that interested, just like I said, in the actual value. I was just trying to, to find the anomaly itself. I think when people are trying to find, you know, more, more sensible data, and, exactly their value they have to be more careful about that i've seen errors being down to 1.5 i think that would be that would be a really good one but yeah in my case that okay well, we have time i think for one one quick last question um, that came in it's in the chat room um and they would like to know uh which software uh did you use i guess for both the uh the uh resistivity and the uh, gpr Okay, so for GPR, I, I used uh, Reflex2 data, and for the, um, they're just, you know, um, so what was going on mostly when you buy a geophysical equipment, software usually comes with it. It's never something general that you, in, in some happy cases, you could use the software for, for more than one equipment, but usually they just come with it. Um, so for my, for my console, the one that I use, um, was um, reflects to data. All right. Well, I think that's all the question time for questions we have for today. Or er, for this. Okay. <laughs> okay, should I stop share now? Right? Yes, please. Okay. And I'm just gonna stop. Thank you, everyone, for listening and for your questions. Thank you, Elena. So we're already into the second talk of today. Uh, we're already into the second talk of today, which will be presented by Ezekiel. He's a student at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom, and he will give us some um, results of the analysis of gravity and aeromagnetic data on basement structures in Nigeria. So Ezekiel, would you please share your screen? We already see you, and you're unmuted. 
Um, yeah. Great. Um, is it now going to is my screen on? Yes, it is. We can see your screen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, go. Good afternoon. I'm Ezekiel Yene from the University of Leeds. I'll be presenting um, my research work on basement structure of lower Benue trough and middle um, from the analysis of gravity and high resolution um, magnetic data. Uh, my supervisors are Chris Green and Tyre in the University of Leeds. Um, as a form of introduction to uh, my research topic, uh, this area is um, an intracontinental rifted uh, basin that is located um, in Nigeria, north of the um, Niger Delta, where uh, the oil and gas is being produced in, in the country. And my research is aimed at mapping and modeling um, basement structures using uh, high resolution um, magnetic uh, aeromagnetic data and gravity compiled and uh, ground gravity data. Um, the, um, the data I'm going to show is on total um, magnetic intensity and also the, the um, coverage of gravity data within the area. Um, the geology of the area is basically Cretaceous um, that is being um, sandwiched by uh, basement on both sides of the area. Uh, this area has thick vegetation and thick sedimentation, making it very difficult for um, ground geophysical and geological exploration. So we uh, um, reduced the total um, magnetic uh, map to the equator since the study area is located around low latitude area and applied um, a method of power spectrum, basically the uh, match band filter in order to separate uh, different anomalies within the area. Uh, we separated shallow um, anomalies from deep anomalies and uh, those that are of near surface anomalies have a lot of noise, so I'm not presenting it uh, in this slide, I'm concentrating on the shallow anomalies. And um, this uh, was located uh, at the depth of um, approximately 1.8 kilometer. And uh, we went further to apply derivatives in order to map out um, faults and contacts, as well as intrusives within the shallow sources of uh, the data. and. Um, we discovered that the magnetic center is concentrated around a particular trend, which is the northeast southwest direction within the trough uh, at that shallow base or at that shallow depth. Uh, we al also um, analyzed the deep sources and uh, mapped out some structures within the deep sources and um, discovered that uh, towards the northern part of the area we have the transtensional fault systems and in the southern part we have the transpressional fault systems and we also identified some structures uh, of um, which are uh, grabbers and hosts uh, within the area generally around the area we applied uh, some methods in order to map the basement uh, basically we use the local wave number and the thickness correction uh, uh, depth methods to map to the top of the basement and graded it in order to uh, pick the structure of the basement. And uh, this is what we're able to get in mapping the uh, morphology of the basement. And uh, we interpreted that uh, some of these structures within the basement are ridges, some are domes while well, some are just up uh, lifted uh, blocks and, and those areas that have very deep um, depths we identified as uh, sub basins and sub troughs within the area. 
uh, we use this map also to produce the uh, sedimentary thickness map of the area where we um, identify areas that have uh, thick sedimentation or um, sediment enrichment and uh, also identify areas that uh, have um, sediment uh, deficiency or sediment thinning within the area. And uh, this um, morphological description of this area uh, gave, gave us the probability of some of some parts of the 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 the, the, the basin being uh, uh, having potential for hydrocarbon. We also looked at the result from gravity, but in this case, we did not apply the same methods that we applied in uh, magnetics. We applied the uh, upward continuation method that involves uh, plotting a distance a cross-sectional distance against uh, gravity anomaly. And we were able to uh, get an optimum uh, depth through which we can separate uh, regional and um, uh, residual anomalies. And um, uh, we also applied the derivatives on uh, the, the uh, residual uh, gravity anomalies in order to pick our fault and uh, contacts and uh, we discovered that in the case of the gravity, the north-south structures were enhanced, uh, which is which was not enhanced in the uh, magnetic data. We also ran the derivative also on the deep sources, and we were able to find um, structures like the grabens and the host distributed within the area with faulting also distributed around the area um, in because of the vertical and um, horizontal variation of uh, density within basins we uh, mapped out the morphology of the basement uh, using 3d gravity inversion basically using the method of uh, the Oldenburg's method and we discover variation in the uh, the density contrast within the trough and I'm going to go through the slides from 500 meters down to um, around 20 meters where we had uh, the, the separation between regional and uh, residual and uh, we discovered that uh, we had um, um, increase in, in, in density as we go down the, the, the basement or down the basin and at 20, we discover that the contrast is becoming more significant. But then we also observed that um, we had the influence of uh, deep sediments within the basin. So we decided to model, uh, forward model the, 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 the area using the depth to basement estimates in order to get the peak, the effect of the sediments within the area. And uh, this is what we were able to get. This is the, um, the sedimentary uh, gravity effects that we were able to extract from the area. And we were able to map the morphology or the uh, basement gravity anomaly within the area, notifying areas of highs and lows within this particular area. And we concluded that uh, the transpersonal and transtensional force systems, as well as the host structures could be possible structural traps within the area. And we also noted the magnetic uh, intrusions, uh, which are also important, as well as those areas that have um, uh, uh, sediment thickening and uh, um, uh, sediment uh, deficiency. Uh, thank you for listening. And I want to acknowledge um, PTDF for sponsoring this research, GTEC for GTEC, um, NGSC, and BGI for supply of the data. Thank you. Thank you for this interesting presentation. So we already have one question. Um, why do you use RTE instead of RTP for the magnetic survey? Hello? Yes, we can still hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So the, I repeat the question. Um, Saki uh, asked, why do you use RTE instead of RTP for the magnetic survey? Okay, uh, we decided to use the uh, RTE because the area is around the low latitude area, very close to the equator. So it was easier for us to, to resolve to the equator rather than resolving to the pole. Okay, I hope this answers the question. Uh, we have another question on, in the chat window. Uh, Mohammed is asking, did you use UBC inversion package? Did you use any bubble data to, as a constraint for your research? Yes, um, because there are no bubble uh, data within the area, we use um, the bubble data very close to the area, which is the Niger Delta, to constrain um, the density contrasts in plotting out or in um, forward modeling the gravity effects within the sediments. And that is the only data we have. We don't have uh, bowl data within the area and we don't have seismic data within the area. So we, are, we just uh, had to use um, um, density data very close to the area, which is the Niger Delta. Okay, any more questions? We still have like two to three minutes for questions. We do have a question. One of our attendees, uh, it's Mohammed has a question. Okay. We'll move him so that he can actually ask his question directly. All right. All right. All right, Mohammed, uh, please ask. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, okay. So, my question is uh, how accurate is the power spectrum method to uh, differentiate between the shallow and the deep sources? Because we already drive the sediment thickness map from the uh, aeromag data and the gravity data based on the power spectrum. Why you didn't use directly the, uh, uh, try to invert the gravity and the magnetic data uh, uh, at the same time? Okay, thank you. Um, the match band uh, filter method, when you use the power spectrum, still have leakages from the shallow anomalies to the uh, um, deeper anomalies. So you still have some parts of the shallow effects being replicated in the deep effects. So in order to, to avoid that, we decided to invert the results we got from estimating depth to basement by magnetics and then use that as a constraint um, because in that method uh, we use we did not use the power spectrum of course so we have avoided the effects of the uh, deep sources on the shallow sources so that acts as a better constraint for us since it assumes that the magnetic susceptibility of the sediments are negligible so we decided to use that you know to, to to plot because in the past spectrum actually it's the depth to those um, anomalies or those depths uh, they are actually um, an average or estimates uh, to those particular sources so they still have some part of the shallow uh, um, anomalies being reflected in the deep anomalies and the deep anomaly reflected in the shallow anomalies and that would not be appropriate to invert directly because if you invert you still have the effect of the deep anomalies still uh, giving you results as part of the shallow anomalies. I hope I answered the question. Yes, and thank you. Um, we are out of time for questions. So we will move to our next uh, presenter.
Uh, okay, so the next presenter uh, is Ashley Smith from the University of Edinburgh, United Kingdom, and the title of the presentation is the removing uh, uh, auroral oval noise from the crustal field signal in satellite magnetic data. So please, Ashley, if you can share your screen and uh, start uh, as when you want. Hang on, I'm just looking for the uh, screen share button. Uh, it's in the in the bottom of the, your screen, the green button. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it says I can't start the screen share while someone else is sharing. Yeah, Ezekiel, would you please unshare your screen? There, I just unshared it for him. All Thank right, you, Rory. try again. Okay, just a second. Okay, good. Should be able to see my screen now. Um, yeah, you have some windows open that we can see as well. All right, there you go. Yeah. Oops. Perfect now. Ah. Yeah, okay, so this is a, oh, let me just get this bigger. So this is another, oh, this is a geomagnetism talk and it's about some um, about sort of a new new way of retrieving the, the global lithospheric field, um, that magnetic field uh, from from satellite data. So this is a brief introduction to to geomagnetism here. So geomagnetism is really spanning kind of geophysics and space physics. So on the right here, you have some description, some uh, illustration of the the origin of the the magnetic field from the core in in flows in, in the outer core. And then in the center here, you have the, the, the crustal field, and down here is more like a what you what you would see in, a, in an aeromagnetic survey of, of the of the crustal field. But when you're up at satellite altitude, you only see these long longer wavelength components. And on the on the, on the left here, this is showing um, the effect of some of the electric currents up in the ionosphere. And then you see this uh, ring around the pole here that's basically associated with the aurora. So this is the um, the interaction with the the solar wind. Um, so really, it's it's uh, spanning these different fields. And if you want to uh, measure them, you need to be able to separate them. So when you make a measurement, you're really measuring some some of all these different fields at the same time, and it's difficult to separate them. Um, so we have these uh, global network of magnetic magnetic observatories, and these have been running for a long time. So here you have a that's uh, an illustration of a, a, a an old one. How how they used to look, and they're not they're not so different today, really. Um, but today we also have these uh, uh, space missions such as Swarm. So I, I'm using the, the Swarm data here. So this is a, a kind of constellation of three spacecraft in, in low Earth orbit. Um, so when we're trying to retrieve the lithospheric field, essentially here we have. Uh, a number of satellite passes over a couple of days and the black line here is the, the, the size of the signal you'll see from the lithospheric field and then this these colored lines are the, the size of the, the so-called noise which is coming from the ionosphere from from all this complex interaction with the solar wind and you see the, the goal here if you're trying to do lithospheric field modeling with satellite data you need to remove all, all this much larger scale uh, much more variable um, contributions to it. So typically what's done is that you select, you, you, you get some years of, of the data. So here this is uh, four years of data. Um, and we, we extract out the data that's taken on, on the night side of the earth when it's dark. So that's when there's less, less interference from the ionosphere. And also when there's lower uh, geomagnetic activity. So there's no events, no geomagnetic storms going on. Um, and you see what, what happens here is you have this alternating pattern of coverage over the, the southern hemisphere and over the northern hemisphere. Um, so it's something to consider when you're just trying to accumulate all this data to get together is that you're, you're taking them at very different times. Um, and there's all kinds of biases that could be introduced because of this. So uh, this is um, sort of an approach that I came up with a couple of years ago where we, we take um, uh, icosahedron and you, you subdivide it and you, you get this um, equal area grid more or less it's as, as, as close as you can get to equal area um, 
And so if you divide it to approximately the, the size of the features that you can resolve for satellite altitude of, of from the atmospheric field, that's about 100 kilometers width, then um, you'll get uh, about 40,000 bins. So within each of these bins, there's a number of satellite tracks that are passing through the bin. And that's what you'll see in, in here is this is the satellite tracks passing through each of the individual bins that I've created. And so what I've done is I just take that as a kind of bucket of data. And I just reduce it to the median at each point. And um, once you've done that, you get this kind of way of uh, being able to summarize the data without doing any sort of further processing, just to see what you're looking at. So this is binned within the geographic coordinates. And if you subtract off so of uh, uh, prior model predictions, so when you subtract off the core, you get this um, hemispheric pattern, and that's due to the magnetic fields from the magnetosphere. If you then also subtract off a model of the magnetosphere, you get what then looks like the, the crustal field. If you subtract off a crustal field model, you then get this, this pattern, and that, that's essentially the, the, uh, the rest of the fields that the model isn't accounting for. So this is most of this pattern here is due to signals in, in the ionosphere that haven't, haven't, been, haven't been modeled. And if you were to sort of continue this, this pattern of subtracting models, if you had some combination models that can predict everything, you would eventually get down, down to, get down to zero, hopefully. Um, so this is another way of looking at the data. So if we look over the poles, um, that's where I'm focusing because of this noise from the oral oval. And if instead of evaluating the median at each point, you evaluate the standard deviation of the data that's contributing, you can see this big messy pattern around here. So this is essentially describing the, the noise associated with the oral oval. So um, to try and reduce that level of noise, we introduced another couple of uh, data selection criteria. Um, the first one is kind of standard thing that's describing how much energy is entering the magnetosphere from the solar wind. And this, this second one is something else that I've, I've added to reduce some of the, uh, to sort of throw away some of the extra satellite tracks that are particularly contaminated. Um, and this is showing the uh, sequence of doing those, those two additional um, data selection. So you see on the left here, that's the number of data that I'm then working with and it's drastically reduced. So I'm throwing away even more of the data, but uh, the noise on the right there you see is uh, consecutively kind of, uh, re reduced by a lot. So it's uh, a nice way of exploring the data graphically and um, seeing what you're working with when you're trying to create a model. So we can take this idea a bit further. So originally, I had done this binning in, in geographic coordinates, but I can also bin them in local time coordinates. So this is basically describing the the uh, the ionosphere. So the, the ionosphere is ordered by by local time. It's where the sun is on the on the on the day side. It's very different from on the night side. Whereas the lithospheric field is obviously ordered ordered by the geographic coordinates. So if I then do that, so this is um, the same data as before, showing that the uh, what the lithospheric field looks like when you grid in those geographic coordinates. And then this is gridding in, in local time coordinates. Um, so now looking over the poles again, these are sort of similar to the last ones you saw, but this is organized by, by local time. So ar around here you have time of day. So this is the, the night side here, and then this is the day side. And so because of this night side criterion that we have in reducing and in, in, in se selecting the data, all of it is on the night side and we have this gap on the day side in, in coverage. I should say this is also <laughs> looking down over the, the North Pole on the top and looking over the South Pole on the bottom. And, and this uh, sort of two cell pattern is, is the, um, the magnetic field that's uh, created by so-called auroral electrojets. So these are um, uh, sort of lines of current that, that flow east-west uh, around around the poles, and it is uh, basically associated with the aurora. Um, so this is another way of, of looking at, at your data and, and seeing what what you've got left, because this is uh, uh, <clears throat> essentially the the un, unaccounted for ionospheric field that is still remaining within the data when we're looking at this lith lithospheric field. 
So if I then take that data uh, that's describing the, the ionospheric field, I can kind of use it to subtract off from the original data um, and try and clean up the, the solidospheric grid that I have. So this is the, the effect of doing that. So if, basically this is the, showing the, the geographic coordinates and, and then the local time coordinates. I'm kind of subtracting this noise off of, off of this because I'm trying to isolate this better. And then it's just showing that the difference between, between those two, two steps, whether you remove that, uh, that uh, the ionospheric prediction or not. And I don't expect you to be able to follow what, what's, uh, what's going on in that, but um, this is showing so sort of how the, um, the bias is, is uh, the, the, the bias introduced by this uh, ionospheric field. Um, so then I can take the, those sort of uh, reduced data that I have and convert it into a, a spherical harmonic model, um, which is the, the standard way for describing these, these global field models. And this is just showing the difference of introducing this correction technique or, or not. Um, but uh, you can stare at it for a while if you want, but <laughs> it's a bit hard to uh, figure out what's going on. Uh, this is a bit of an, an overview, overview there, but I'm going to have to skip this for time. But uh, I have the link to the slides in, this, in, in the chat if you want to have a look at it for more. But uh, yeah, I'm skipping over these for now. I just wanted to point out a couple of Python libraries that I rely on, it's X-Array and Cartify. Um, and yes, so it's this kind of simple technique for summarizing the data and so you can visualize it quite nicely and it's showing some promise as a way of removing this uh, all over noise. So I'll uh, finish it there. Thanks for listening. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ashley, for uh, yeah, this interesting topic and uh, the presentation. Uh, so now we have uh, time for questions. And uh, I think we have already one here uh, from Taimur Hassan. Uh, so he was asking, what is actually auroral oval noise? So this is the, the magnetic field that is produced by the auroral oval on this. A oval oval is the the uh, the oval around each of the magnetic poles, where energy from the solar wind is coming in and driving electric currents in the ionosphere. And so, when we talk about internal field modeling, where we're using magnetic data on on the ground or or at satellite altitudes, you're you're measuring this some of these different sources. And if you're trying to extract out the the internal fields or the, the core field or the lithospheric field then you also have this signal in there from the overall oval, so from these electric currents, and you're just trying to remove that. So that's the, the noise at that point. Okay. Any, anyone has uh, another question? There's a, a question in the chat box um, and uh, Muhammad asks how do you separate core field to lithospheric field? So in, in this case I'm just using a sort of prior determined model of the uh, of the core field and I'm just subtracting that prediction from from the data yeah I mean I could sort of take it further and, and model that as well at the same time, but it will be uh, complicated to do all these things at once. All right, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of uh, time for question and answers. Uh, and so that brings us to uh, Hannah. I'll let Pedro introduce her. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the next speaker is Hannah Rogers, uh, also from the University of Edinburgh in the UK. And uh, with the topic and the title of her presentation, uh, Scotland and Space, what I've learned about how geophysics applies to space industry. So thank you, Anna, and you can start. Uh, great, can everyone hear me and see the slides? Great, so um, hi, my name is Hannah. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I would like to talk to you about Scotland and space. How does geophysics 
apply in the industry. Um, and to do this, I'm going to talk quickly about the space industry and how it's changing before focusing on why I think this is relevant to earth scientists and particularly geophysicists. Um, I must apologise now, I thought this would be very much a European focused audience, so if I can't answer questions on particular things, I'm very sorry in advance. So it has be recently been announced that we are entering a new space era. And Gone are the days of the space race and large international collaborative projects run by government organisations have very much been overtaken by private investments and smaller satellites called CubeSats being launched uh, by commercial entities. So these satellites are said to be in a constellation when we have multiple satellites that are in multiple places around the Earth and they kind of form a grid. So this change from like old space to new space is kind of best shown by these two images. So, um, um, so we can see on this graph on the left that um, satellites that are over 500 grams have stayed, kilograms have stayed pretty much relatively constant, but these small sats have really grown exponentially um, over time. And also the people who are launching these people um, have changed. So in 2014, there was a real acceleration as commercial industry uh, started to launch these smaller satellites up into space. And a CubeSat is basically made up of Rubik's Cube size blocks, and you can stack these together to form small satellites. As space and weight is at a premium, the, a lot of the engineering focus is on trying to miniaturize existing technologies. Um, in the bottom left here, um, we have a 6U CubeSat, so it's 10 centimetres deep, 20 centimetres across and 30 centimetres tall. And inside here we have an atomic uh, clock payload. And this is, the aim of this is to eventually be launched in a constellation as shown in the middle here. And this would allow us to take really accurate uh, location measurements from anywhere on the planet once a full constellation is um, achieved. So this is just basically to give you a kind of quick introduction to what CubeSats are. So why do we want to use CubeSats? Um, the main reason is that they're much more cost effective. Um, we can take multiple um, Earth observation measurements simultaneously, but the main drawback is that this is a relatively new industry and some regulatory systems are not yet set up. But all in all, CubeSats seem to be the major point of space change and more and more companies are adopting these and government organizations. So the way we observe our Earth is changing. And in fact, a recent report announced that 13 out of the 17 sustainable development goals um, could be kind of assisted by space technology and satellite technology. So as well as um, understanding how this is impacting our uh, research, we might want to consider how this could be impacting our future careers. So um, here are some excerpts from the Size and Health of the UK Space Industry 2018 report from the UK Space Agency and the London School of Economics. And here on the left, you can see that 69.5% of 14.8 billion pounds was estimated to be in space applications. And the majority of that is in data science. So people using data acquired from satellites to understand our Earth. In the top right, we have a kind of breakdown by industry and what those industries are really focused on. But what this report really makes clear is that the industry is growing and growing and the government is investing, the UK government is investing more and more in this industry. But the two main hindrances with the growth of this industry is the uncertain nature of the market currently and the lack of skilled professionals who want to work in this industry. So why did I choose to give this talk? So I have one month left of a six month industry placement funded through my NERC PhD, um, work for a company in Edinburgh called Orbital Microsystems. And I've had a really amazing five months and I wanted to share some of the experiences that I didn't think that my background as a geophysicist would necessarily have let me have. So up in the top right, this is one of the CubeSats being launched from the International Space Station, which you 
I got to watch live from Earth um, with the feed from NASA. And then on the left here, this is the US consulate in Scotland. We ran an event for her, um, kind of opening up some of our new products. Um, this is a CubeSat that I saw live in person. Uh, we got to attend the UK Space Conference and chat to a whole load of industry and academic background and just hear about what the future of the space sector in the UK looked like. And then like over here on the right, kind of getting down to the science of it, this is a picture over Typhoon Hagabis, the typhoon that recently stopped the uh, Rugby World Cup happening in Japan. And you can really see that there's quite a lot of detail. So alongside this, I've been writing proposals for the European Space Agency and doing website design and doing a whole load of different bits and pieces that I just did not really think about doing. So from the science side of things, what orbital microsystems do is they have miniaturized a microwave radi radiometer. And so at each frequency, you get a thin slice through the atmosphere. So you get really good vertical resolution of storm structure. And this allows us to kind of understand a lot more about whether weather systems are growing or shrinking or um, what could be where storms could be moving next. When a full constellation of satellites are launched, we're hoping for 15 minutes uh, repeat times as opposed to about six hours that you would expect from government satellites. So, and if you just look at this kind of like image here, so starting at channel eight, you're kind of near the surface and we're going slowly up through the atmosphere. And it gives us a really good 3D structure of the storms. So you can kind of see the peninsula here and then as you go up, the, um, the atmosphere becomes more uniform. And on the right, we're comparing our data compared to some government data sources. So the NOAA sources are American satellites and the FY3C is Chinese data set. And not only are our sensors more accurate spatially, because they're cheaper, we're more likely to launch more of them and then we'll be able to achieve this 15 minute temporal resolution. So um, yeah, I've been doing some work alongside and looking at this data, which has often been the first time that people have been able to look at these storms with radar data and that's been really exciting. So all in all, the industry would like our skills and that's a whole load of different skills that I didn't really have time to list out in whole um, but I think until I did this internship I was not aware that the space the space industry is really looking for geophysicists and people with our skills to go and work for them and um, I wanted to list some organizations here that you might be particularly interested in so um, at least as far as I know in the UK there is funding available for early career scientists to go and work in the space industry. So Catapult have a spin placement program and uh, the SEDS company, so, uh, SEDS organization, so UK SEDS uh, is the UK branch, but I, they are worldwide. Um, they kind of focus on building hubs where you can get involved with the space industry and do work building CubeSats and various things. Um, so ESA have a whole range of business development um, and people that you can get in contact with to kind of, if you are interested in breaking into this kind of uh, background then, or this kind of industry, there's a lot of companies that are out there and willing to help you. And um, that's kind of where I wanted to leave it, except for just to say, um, I hope this has been interesting and yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Hannah, uh, for uh, your presentation. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very interesting topic about space nowadays. That's uh, maybe it's uh, one goal of the future of uh, the science. Uh, I don't have uh, <laughs> any question, but uh, just a comment about uh, the, your interesting work, uh, mainly the final part. Uh, just to mention the different opportunities for those that are interested, also the skills that are very important for the, the, the upcoming uh, years, like about coding and so on, no matter if you are 
geo, geo, geophysicist or engineer. I think it's the, the core of the skills that for sure the, as uh, um, for us, all of us as a geoscientist, I think it's uh, very important to have and to improve. Uh, yeah, and I think it's uh, very good. So yeah, thank you again for your presentation. I don't know if there is any other questions from the, the audience. Yes, I, um, Hannah, uh, there's a, a question. Um, how did you first learn about uh, this opportunity to have a, uh, an internship? Um, so because I'm funded through um, the NERC DTP at the University of Edinburgh, um, as a condition of my funding, I have to do a six month internship. Um, which the reason why I came here was because uh, there was an opportunity that came up that uh, someone in the school advertised and um, I just decided it sounded interesting. Um, that being said, I think there are lots of money that if you are interested in doing internships that you can probably try and look for. Um, if you have particular questions, feel free to email me. Uh, it kind of depends where you are based and what you're doing, I think. Um, and often small startups um, struggle with kind of supporting you unless you can bring that kind of guaranteed funding, either from your research organization or from a company like Catapult who um, help fund these placements. So, but it kind of depends on every individual situation. So. I got lucky, I'm afraid. Okay, uh, we have a, a question in the, the chat box. Yes, from uh, Alexandro Dimitri. So he was asking that uh, Hannah, in your opinion and based in your um, experience, uh, what is the most used geophysics method uh, in the, the space field? Um, so I think I think they're looking for our skills more than like a particular method. Um, so Ashley spoke briefly about the fact that um, there's the swarm constellation, and um, they also do gravity and optical imaging and radar. And but we're taught about all of these things, but looking down and into the earth. But we can also turn those sensors outwards and look out into space. And there's slightly different processing, but we understand how the earth works because that's what our training gives us. So yes, it's not that you're going to come in and you'll be able to know everything instantly, but actually we've got the skills and this is an industry that needs those kind of skills. And that's what I'm just trying to do. I'm trying to bring together the fact that I had no idea that I could get into this kind of an industry until doing this internship. And I think more geophysicists should know that the space community needs people like us to go and work for them. All right, um, we're actually uh, out of uh, time for questions and answers. Oh wait, we have maybe one more question. Oh, no, it's the same question. All right, so we're out of time for questions and answers. We're going to take a 10 uh, a 10 minute break and all right well welcome back uh, hopefully uh, you had a nice break and we're able to get some tea or coffee uh, and i'm gonna uh, turn it back over to our co-chairs for our second session of the day which is on um, geophysical methods so stephanie and mariana excellent thank, thank you very much Laurie. Um, so to kick off our um, second session on geophysical methods, we have Pedro Pereira from the Instituto Superior Technical from the University of Lisbon in Portugal. Um, and he will be talking about iterative geostatistical size of conversion incorporating local isotropies. Um, so Pedro, could you unmute yourself and uh, share your screen? Uh, yes. Excellent, thank you.
okay. Uh, are you seeing the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, uh, so uh, my title, as uh, Stephanie said, uh, it's uh, under the scope of uh, uh, generative geostatistical seismic inversion. Uh, okay, I'm a PhD uh, candidate uh, in petroleum engineering in the University of Lisbon. Uh, and today, okay, uh, I'm going to talk about this topic. This is just the outline of my presentation and starting from the beginning, in the introduction. Uh, so, um, what is the, the main goal uh, about uh, this work or this scope? Uh, it's related with uh, the, the data that we have uh, and uh, we want to estimate the, the subsurface elastic and petrophysical properties. And, uh, uh, through that, uh, we use the data to infer these properties, and this is just a general uh, workflow about uh, about the, these uh, these methods. So, yeah, we infer uh, with the stochastic simulation the, the several motor realization properties uh, that we have. We just uh, uh, afterwards do the, the forward modeling uh, to compute the synthetic seismic. And uh, in a trace by trace basis, we compare with our uh, reference or uh, uh, observed one. And uh, this is an iterative loop uh, that, that uh, try to optimize from iteration to iteration the, the, the properties or, or the models, the inverted models that we have. Uh, and uh, we want to achieve the best fit ones. Uh, so, uh, just uh, to mention that uh, it. Uh, to base uh, this algorithm in the stochastic sequential uh, simulation uh, that uh, we want to reproduce uh, from our experimental data, for instance, the well logs, the properties that we have. So we want to reproduce the, the histograms, uh, that means the distribution from the logs to the properties. Uh, also the, 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 the spatial continuity patterns from these properties that we want to estimate that are re represented by the variogram models uh, that are a, a B-point uh, statistic uh, algorithm or uh, technique uh, that uh, allow us to reproduce the... Pedro, the, sorry, one second. We're getting some flashing from your screen, kind of the background's coming up. Are you seeing that as well? Uh, sorry? The, the background of your computer seems to keep flashing up every so often behind your presentation. Um, we're seeing that on our screen. Oh, okay, so maybe. You just try and load it again. Maybe I will share again. <laughs> I don't know what, what happened. Okay, excellent. It was, yeah, thank you. Oh, it's still okay. still happening. Okay, okay sorry. that's fine. Carry on. It's not it's not a problem. It's still happening a little bit, but it it's okay. We'll we'll continue. Okay. So sorry about uh, that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I was I was saying uh, okay. Uh, the, this algorithm just shared these properties, and the last one, uh, since it is a just statistical algorithm, our experimental data that is from the well logs, it also is reproduced uh, in the final models. Uh, so, so, as a motivation uh, for this uh, for this um, work, usually when we are creating the the, the inversion grid from the seismic uh, that we want to invert, uh, usually we pick the top of the reservoir or the bottom, and we just create a parallel uh, uh, grid uh, based on this uh, reference surface. So, if uh, when we do the flattening uh, of the seismic because these algorithms to simulate needs a Cartesian grid that needs to be flat. The, the, all the, the cells are, uh, are regular, let's say. So if we have a, 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 sh a, sh um, a flat geometry, when we do the flattening, it's okay for the algorithm. For instance, in the example two, that we have a more complex uh, geometry of the, the geological structures. What, what happens when we do the flattening from this top or bottom reservoir surface is that uh, in between we have several uh, uh, 
let's say, layers uh, that are not uh, flattened. So uh, we, may, we may have problems when we are simulating the models. So to overcome this, uh, what is proposed is uh, the, uh, the integration of local anisotropies uh, in the iterative just statistical seismic inversion workflow. That is this general workflow that we can divide in different stages uh, from the, the work. So the first stage, uh, it's uh, based on the estimation of seismic reflectors orientation that we get our seismic Q, the 3D one. Uh, we estimate the for, from uh, seismic attributes the local azimuth and depth of the reflectors. Um, Pedro, sorry, sorry again, it's still flashing. Could you try and take it out of um, presentation mode and see if that's better? Because it is doing it quite a lot, so we can't see your, um, your slides very well. Yeah, could you possibly? No, it's still happening. Uh, talk from this. Yeah, if we can still see the the, the flashing, it's um. Okay. Um. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Try showing it again. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it will happen. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, okay, the, the, the next stage it's about the automatic variogram model, modeling, that uh, we pick the each azimuth and deep uh, uh, seismic attributes, and from these we, we estimate the three main directions of the space uh, regarding the variogram models. So we compute experimental variograms, and after uh, it's, uh, um, we do the fitting of these experimental variograms from a variogram model, and uh, is doing locally and according to the three main uh, uh, um, directions of the space. The vertical one, the main direction that is that follows the, the reflector's orientation, and the, the minor direction, the horizontal one, that is just perpendicular to this main direction. So from this, we came out with a, with a steering and isotropy volumes that are going to be used in the other stage that corresponds to the, the, the inversion algorithm itself and used in the stochastic simulation with a, with a simulation with local anisotropies. So uh, as a secondary variables and just follow the normal, uh, the, the, the normal workflow of seismic inversion. We do the forward modeling, we compute the synthetic seismic, we compare the trace by trace, and after the last step, it's, the, it's called the stochastic update. It's uh, from the best traces that have higher correlation uh, uh, coefficient between the synthetic and the reference seismic. We just store in auxiliary volumes, as well as the, the, the property that we are inverting and used in the cost simulation process, uh, again, to the generation of a new set of models. And so this is an iterative loop until we reach uh, a, good, a good model uh, after, for instance, six iterations. That is the case that I'm going to show just uh, some uh, results. So here uh, I'm showing the, uh, some vertical section and horizontal slice from our model. This is a siliciclastic environment. We have some sands and shells. Uh, and uh, so in this case, uh, what, uh, what we are comparing it's the proposed method with this uh, local information with the global one that uh, is uh, the traditional method used. And uh, as we can see, uh, we, have, uh, we have a better uh, reproduction of the seismic reflectors. Uh, for instance, in the middle, I don't know if you can see a presence here of a, a channel. And uh, for instance, from the traditional method uh, that uh, we, that we used, we cannot uh, we cannot see, for instance, this channel, uh, and with the proposed method, it's uh, more clear uh, the evidence uh, for these geological structures. Uh, also, I'm showing here the local correlation coefficient. That is also a, um, a method that we use uh, to corroborate the 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 results that we have. So we can see that between the synthetic and real seismic. We have a, a, 
we have some uh, traces that have a good correlation, as we can see from the, the color scale here. It's from 0 to 1, so we have uh, approximately, approximately uh, almost one from uh, from these these uh, these traces, and uh, the other one we we lack uh, this higher correlation, and so the results are a bit poor. And the same behavior from the slice that we see in the <coughs> on the on the right. Um, so here are the acoustic uh, impedance that was the property that uh, um, that was used to to invert. Uh, and this is the best fit model after the iterative loop, the optimization process, we get uh, the, this, uh, this model. So as we can see here, we see the, the presence of the, the, the channel that was also observed from the seismic in the, in the vertical section. Uh, also uh, in, the, in the right bottom of the, of the model, we see the presence of uh, a fold. And we see that the spatial continuity of the property is not so well reproduced when we use uh, the just a global variogram to, to reproduce these uh, this, uh, this patterns. And uh, even for, uh, from the, the, on the right, the, the section, the, um, the slice that we have here, uh, we, can, we can clearly see a presence of a meandering channel repre represented by the lower acoustic impedance values. Uh, that uh, are also associated with uh, higher positive values. So, uh, as we can see here, and the other one, the channel is not so well reproduced. And uh, just uh, some final uh, images here, just for the validation of the method. Since we are using the seismic attributes, in this case, I have in the, on the left the azimuth. On top, it's the input uh, uh, data that we are. Uh, constraining the simulation of the models and in the bottom it's the output from the output seismic. We can see that the pattern is uh, well reproduced from the azimuth values uh, throughout the, 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 the slice. Also, as I mentioned before, uh, we also, um, the algorithm also reproduced the variograms and the histograms. So here I'm just showing that even incorporating this local information, uh, the the variograms and the histograms are reproduced. So for instance, here, the north-south uh, direction, we see the behavior uh, increasing in the x, uh, x axis, that is uh, the, the range or the, the, the distance. And we see that the behavior, it, it's quite the same. And also from the well-log data, our experimental data, we have this distribution of values that are also reproduced in the, the final model. So just some final remarks uh, that I want to just to, to stress, that we can uh, generate, uh, uh, m improve the structural and stratigraphic, stratigraphic geological consistency in the models that we inverted. We can also <coughs> reduce the spatial uncertainty because these methods, since our models, uh, the whole models are wrong, but some are useful. So if you reduce the uncertainty, we are getting more at the main goal. Uh, allow us to apply some uh, geostatistical techniques, the traditional ones for the simulation, the grid that needs to be regular. And uh, so uh, <coughs> we avoid the, the flattening process as it was the motivation of the work. And uh, finally, uh, this this uh, this proposed workflow also uh, avoids the need of using training image or any other prior knowledge, uh, since the information regarding the spatial continuity pattern of the property uh, it comes directly from our the seismic reflection data. Uh, so yeah, I would like to thank you for our uh, for your attention and also to acknowledge the the companies and the, the university that supported this work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro, for that was a really interesting talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the in the Q and A section or or in the chat, and and we can put them to Pedro if you want to raise your hand and ask him one directly. Um, feel free. You're more than welcome. Um, I have. A, a very a, a quick question, really. So you 
you use this, um, you mentioned in one of your comments at the end that you don't need to use a prime information as it's all included in your seismic reflection data. Um, is it possible to, to include a bit of a prime information, say you had a data from a, a well log or, or something that you wanted to include, would we be able to add that into your method as well? Uh, sorry, I think I didn't uh, listen uh, quite well the, the question. So, sorry. Um, so you say all your um, prior information comes from the reflection, seismic reflection data, and you don't put any prior information through geostatistical models. Would you be able to, if you wanted to, put in some different prior information that's not just from your seismic reflection data? Uh, yes, uh, we could uh, um, also use uh, some uh, <coughs> some expected uh, uh, patterns from, uh, for instance, uh, um, assigning some distributions uh, from uh, to each to each point of the grid that we want to simulate. We could also use some uh, uh, a priori models uh, that. I don't know, we, we can use from different techniques and also integrate as auxiliary variables, uh, try to constrain the, the, the model and uh, try to achieve, uh, better achieve the, the results. Because uh, since there are uh, always some uncertainties and uh, errors in the, in the modeling process, uh, so uh, all the knowledge that uh, we, can, uh, we can gather and try to integrate, it's always uh, an advantage uh, for this kind of uh, seismic inversion methods, yeah. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Pedro. Um, we're out of time for questions and we're a little bit over, so uh, we probably uh, should uh, ask people if they have questions for Pedro to put them in the chat and we can send them to you later on. Uh, we are ready to move to our final talk. Our speaker will be Aurelian Roser from Freire Universität Berlin in Germany and Aurelian will talk about ray tracing with adaptive step size control in an homogeneous anisotropic media. So Aurelian, I think we all see your screen. Uh, so off you go. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm actually happy to have the last talk. I will, um, unfortunately I will provide some equations but I keep it uh, on the low numbers and I'm happy that I won't rob anybody's time after me. So um, I'm coming from a micro seismic background. Micro seismicity, we often use ray tracing for various applications. For example, we use ray tracing to um, localize earthquakes. We use it to invert for velocity models. We use it to invert for moment tensors so various applications. And we were asking ourselves, um, how can we make ray tracing more efficient and especially more user friendly since most of our people actually work with ray tracing and don't have a strong background in ray tracing. So they use it as a tool, but they don't know about the details and don't have a good gut feeling about what parameters to use and how to work with that. So um, we tried to answer this question and we actually did. And on this slide, I want to show you a comparison of what standard ray tracing algorithms do with um, constant step size. This will be the animation on the left side. And um, in comparison to this, our proposal with um, so-called adaptive step size control, this animation you will see on the right side of the screen. What we see, we have, um, let me maybe change pointer. We have a source at the bottom of this um, generic model and the color in, in this box indicates um, changing parameters in terms of velocity and isotropy. So we have some homogeneous parts in the medium, so we have some rather inhomogeneous, heterogeneous parts of the medium. And uh, let's just have a look at uh, what standard algorithms and our algorithm do. So we see with the constant step size, independent of what the part of the medium actually looks like, um, the ray tracing algorithm always uses the same step size. And we thought it would be actually quite nice to somewhat develop a, well, let's say, clever ray tracer, which would automatically see in which part of the medium it currently is with its ray trajectory, so is it homogeneous or inhomogeneous part. And in the frame of my talk today, I will show you our um, answer to this question. Um, just some equations coming back to kinematic ray theory. So actually, we can apply this method to both kinematic and dynamic ray tracing. However, today I won't only um, talk about kinematic ray theory. So we have the Iconal equation, which basically says 
that an, an eigenvalue of the Christoffel equation, Iconal equation in this case, labeled G, which is a function of the location R and slowness P, is a product over um, density normalized elasticity components or C components and um, times um, the slowness vector times the polarization vector. And for a given wave type, this always equals one. And if we want to find um, um, the ray trajectory, so how will our ray propagate through our medium, we have to um, calculate partial derivatives of this eigenvalue G. And this gives us the ray tracing system, which consists of six equations three equation describing the um, change of location over time as um, partial derivatives of this g um, over derivative um, of the slowness and three more equations describing the um, change of slowness over time. And we just take one um, time step within our ray tracing system. We propagate our ray from the location and slowness at point Tn um, solve these six equations, multiply this by our chosen step size, and then can use this to update for new location and slowness. So this is just basic theory. The interesting part is how do we implement this numerically in an efficient way? Um, usually people do this uh, with so-called Hohenkutter methods, and they are described by two parameters, the number, the order M, which basically describes the accuracy of the method. So up to which order do we um, describe our numerical implementations um, following the Taylor series expansion. And the second parameter is um, the parameter S, the number of stages we perform within each time step to achieve this goal. So um, I think all of us in, in high school heard about the Euler method. Basically, this means that we use derivative information at the beginning of a certain time step to extrapolate our value and then get the information at the beginning of the next time step. This stands for order M and we have one stage. If we then complicate this a bit more, we get the midpoint method. This is also, I think, still high school knowledge that we actually don't use the derivative information at the beginning of the time step, but in, uh, just in the middle of the time step. Then in most scientific applications, people further complicate this and um, use the classical Runge quarter method, um, which I label RK4. This has order four and four stages. And um, in, in seismology, unfortunately, we don't see any other um, Runge quarter methods, but in other fields of science, of science people um, actually use much more complicated Runge quarter methods. And um, we adopted one of these called the cache carp method, which I label as RKCK, and this also has order four, but use six stages within each time step to um, actually calculate, our, in our case, location and slowness at the beginning of the next time step. So you may ask yourself, okay, why, what's the benefit of having two more stages and more computational um, problems to um, more or less get the same result? Well, let me show you. Um, to solve our ray tracing system with the cache card method, we need um, our two um, um, sets of equations in, in general six equations from the ray tracing system, which we had a couple of slides ago. And uh, we use these to calculate so-called location and slowness increments. They are labeled by this delta R and delta P. And once we've done this for all stages within each time step, we can weigh them with um, weights um, beta and beta prime to um, calculate the location and slowness values for the beginning of uh, the next time step. So with the cache card method, uh, we, or the other way around, with regular standard classical runge quarter methods, uh, we use um, parameters which only include uh, dependencies between the stages, alpha, and one set of weights, beta. But with the cache carb method, we introduced, or cache carb actually at the beginning of the 20th century, introduced, um, of 21st century, introduced the second set of um, weights. And we use this information that we get for two estimates of the location at the beginning of the next time step to estimate how accurately did we perform our time step. So let's have a short look at what those parameters look like. They're usually presented in so-called butcher tableaus which depending on the um, order M look a bit um, ugly, 
but basically up here we see the dependencies between and the several stages within each time step and here we see the two sets of weight. So how are the um, stages of the increment vectors weighted to and then perform calculated average over all stages for the next time step. And when we compare the difference between those two estimates for the location, relative to a user-provided error tolerance in the location domain, which we call epsilon r, and then take the maximum value, so let's say the, the worst, the biggest, worst estimate, the biggest differences of estimates, we get the so-called truncation error estimate. And this we can use to calculate the optimal step size um, um, for either the next time step or the current time step. We use this formula provided by Butcher in 2016, with our current um, step size, with current time step n, and this is our optimal step size. And the second perf um, performing part in our algorithm which we use is the so-called step rejection criterion, um, depending on how big this truncation error estimate is, we say, okay, we accept the accuracy, it's small enough, we can go on to the next time step, or we actually have to repeat the current time step. And usually you would argue, okay, if this is bigger than the allowed error tolerance, then we have to repeat the time slip. But actually it can be shown that it's numerically wise to um, increase this value to um, for uh, when we put the method in the order of 4 to 7.48. So basically if the um, epsilon is larger than 7.48, uh, we have to repeat the time step with the new optimal step size, so reduce our step size, and then check if the reduced step size actually provides better results. Of course, when an inhomogeneous part is the medium. If our epsilon is smaller than this value, we can confidently increase the step size because most likely we're in a rather homogeneous part of the medium and um, further propagate our rate. So a lot of theory, now get into some um, um, examples. We tested the algorithm on several models. Right now, I just want to show you um, a strongly anisotropic velocity model, which comes from a microsized big um, experiment in Northwestern Canada. So we see uh, we're in depth of roughly 1.4 to 1.8 kilometers. And um, we have strong velocity contrast and also strong anisotropy indicated by the Thomson parameters. Um, on the next couple of slides, you will see rays which were shot from a source at the depth of 1.8 kilometers in um, um, vertical and sub-horizontal directions. So we shoot rays in steps of 5 degree from vertical to sub-horizontal. And we will see a comparison of how um, standard homocodal methods in our approach perform for different step sizes. Let's have a look. If we have no experience with ray tracing, just uh, want to perform ray tracing for this medium to get some travel times, get some ray trajectories, we say, oh, well, let's start maybe with a constant step size of 10 to the power minus one seconds. People are more familiar with the topic and um, with models like these will say, this is just too big. You have to perform this um, with a smaller step size and actually see this was an error. Because if we hit the wrong spot in our medium, we will see that the ray tracing system fails, so we get some erroneous results. We have to perform it again with a smaller step size. Um, on the current and the next few slides, we'll always see a comparison between um, the ray trajectories for the chosen step size and, let's say, the perfect step size. Um, as perfect, we declared a um, constant value of 10 to the power minus 4 seconds. So this is highly inefficient, but um, as close as it almost gets for accurate ray project, um, propagation. Um, now let's reduce our constant step size with the classical algorithms to 10 to the power minus 2 seconds. We see we get more time steps. So it, now it actually makes sense to, to count the number of time steps. And we see that the green lines were computed, um, computed 100 times faster than the gray lines. If we further decrease this to 10 to the power minus 3 seconds, we get more time steps. Now we even hardly see each individual time step. And I can tell you the differences are really small. But the true um, um, answer to our problem actually hides behind all these um, dots for each time step but there are still some very small differences. So it depends 
for accuracy you want to propagate your rays. And we see, um, as expected, for a 10 times bigger um, constant slab size, we are 10 times faster in the computation time. So this is what standard ray tracing algorithms do. Let's have a look how our ray, um, algorithm performs. If we choose constant... Aurelian, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we are a bit off schedule, so I think you just have a bit more uh, two minutes uh, to yeah. present, to finish your presentation. So, um, I'm almost at the end. So okay, sorry, it's no fine. <laughs> fine. Yeah, sure. So Thank you very much. Different um, um, pro user-provided error tolerances, let's say 10 to the power minus 6 meters, we see um, if we don't see the best result because it hides behind our um, rate trajectories. And this is 6.9 times, six times faster. We can choose um, different values, slightly bigger, which we actually found in the previous study to be quite accurate for microseismic applications, 9.7 times faster, and it basically provides the same result. We can even further increase the value, um, we get less time steps, 15.4 times faster, and the same result. And this already brings me to my conclusions because we were able to actually um, adapt this concept quite well understood in different parts of science and show that adaptive set size control not only increases the efficiency for ray tracing in um, complicated media, but it also relieves users from having some kind of prior knowledge about how rays will um, propagate in time and location domain within your medium. And it also guarantees a user um, defined accuracy so that you can say or relatively big span of these, are, of these um, user truncation error estimates, uh, we get more or less the same results. Um, I want to acknowledge my university and our sponsors um, and as a keep for giving me this opportunity um, to present this. And if you're interested in any of the research, so we have publications, the SEG and EAGE and in meetings. And um, in journals, there are also publications in um, preparation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aurelian. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, I personally, I personally don't have any question, but if someone has, feel free to leave it in the Q Q and A section or in the chat box. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Well, if we don't have any question, I think we are good to thank you again, Aurelian, for this presentation and to maybe close this event.